Well, this is indeed a momentous uh, occasion because I'm here with a small select number of people, all reasonably spaced out, uh, spaced out meaning, you know, distance as opposed to any other kind of spaced out, of course. And we are looking forward to this event in person, as I hope you are, whether you're way out somewhere in another country, or maybe somewhere else in the UK, or in good old London. This evening in good old London, it's beautifully sunny. What are we doing inside? Well, we'll find the answer to that question fairly soon. But I have with me some of my BCS colleagues. I have David, who is doing our technical things, and that's David Grundy. I have Santana, who is actually going to speak later on. And I have Maureen, who is in the um, uh, North London branch and runs the Seniors Initiative. And Santana is the head of our Eco Initiative. And this is part of our Central and North London branches Eco Initiative. So truly great things. I hope you have caught the event we had two days ago. If you didn't, I'll just tell you that it was a really good event focused on an organization nobody's heard of called the IUCN. What does that stand for? Well, here's a clue. First, I stands for international and the last letter N stands for network. But what they do is truly amazing. And they do it in order to monitor eco. They do it in order to monitor the, the land and its species, whether they are plant species or animal species, and tell us the health of those and try and keep those in good balance, as it were. Tonight, we're going to focus on the water, the majority of the planet, the water, the oceans, that area that we know little about. And you can see the screen. I hope you've been looking at that for a few minutes. So you've read what this session is about. Now, unfortunately, we couldn't rustle up the original Mayflower, but I'm actually pleased to say IBM and numerous other organizations have been working on that. And we have a great representative from IBM, and that's Rosie, who is going to tell us much more about the Mayflower autonomous ship. What's an autonomous ship? Can you book tickets? Can you get a balcony room? We'll find out from Rosie in a few minutes. So this is going to be about the Mayflower, first of all. And then we will have the, my colleague Santana, who I mentioned before, telling us about some of the eco initiatives in Santana's six simple tips for eco success for all of us. And that is going to be really interesting as well. That's going to be about five or six minutes from Santana after Rosie's session. And that will be followed by more from Margaret. Margaret Ross, who is very much a mainstay of the BCS, especially around the South Coast. So uh, we're talk talking about Solent University. We're talking about BCS Hampshire, BCS Dorset, all the old stalking grounds of the old Mayflower, you might gather, and also of the new Mayflower. And Margaret will tell us a little bit more about her eco passions, some of which you see outlined on screen here. And she will also tell us about an initiative she's launched for schools and competitions to do things with your school, children, colleagues, contacts, and so on about sustainability and what sustainability means to me. Well, I've managed to sustain things so far, but I'm going to keep going for just a couple minutes more because I want to tell you about some of the great events we've got coming up. We've got lots. First, let's flip to the dark side, to the world of ransomware. Should you pay or should you pray? or are those not mutually exclusive? Come to see this event 
and find out more. This is going to be with Sarah, who is the chief security advisor for a company called Microsoft, which you might have heard of. And she is a great speaker and has become a great fan of the BCS. And indeed, she has become a fellow of the BCS. So that will be well worth seeing as well. And then another great woman in another great theme that we're running, which is called Women's Inspiration. One inspirational woman with inspiration for everybody is the theme there. And we have not one, but two here because we have Wendy Mars, who is very senior. She's a senior vice president at Cisco and also in charge, she's the president of the EMEA region. EMEA in Cisco terms means Europe, Middle East, Africa, and Russia sneaked in the R as well, I see. And Wendy is indeed a great inspiration as well. And we have Chloe interviewing her as she has done for all the other women inspiration speakers as well, and drawing out some of the story of Wendy's passage to where she is now and her messages for all of us. So that'll be really good too. So all of that, and also, if you're not an evening person, but you're a daytime person, Maureen, who's in the audience with us here, is going to be running some sessions, which we call Coffee and Chat. They're afternoon sessions, and they will start on October the 4th. And afternoon with Maureen, two hours from two till four on Coffee and Chat, or if you prefer, Tea and Talk. Take your pick. I haven't thought of something with W, but um, <laughs> you could just come and whinge and have whinges and water again with Maureen and with other seniors and other colleagues. So there you've heard about some of our initiatives. Today is to do with eco. Later, we will have seniors. We've got a theme called IT Heads 2021. We've got one called Women's Inspiration. So lots of different themes that we're running in the central and North London branches of the BCS. Enough, that's enough of me, I think. The schedule for this evening is Rosie, followed by questions and answers too. So please enter your Q and your questions in the question box. If you want help of some other kind, then enter that in the chat. And if we can, we'll help you. Although I'm afraid we can't rush over to your place. It's gotta be remote. Uh, as far as the chat is concerned, we will monitor that as well. And our good friend, David is monitoring those right now. So look forward to great questions from you. Please do come up with those. After Rosie has presented, shown her videos, and then answered the Q&A, we'll switch over to Santana, and he'll give us his six tips, plus show a video, we're into videos at the moment. And then we'll go to Margaret, who will tell us more. So that's the schedule for this evening, approximate runtime till eight o'clock. So hope you enjoy it. Please settle back, relax, and enjoy the show. Now over to Rosie. Just need that. The clicker? Oh, that's just me. Thank you. Do you want to hit the video straight away? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm unmute. Unmute? Yes, I'm unmuted. So it should be good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, let's go. This is an awesomely powerful thing. There are vast areas of the ocean that we know literally nothing about. We know more about the surface of the moon than certain parts of our own planet. It's that ignorance that should scare us because the ocean controls the entire climate on our planet. This project is not about the last 400 years. It's about the next 400. It's about the future. The Mayflower Autonomous Ship is inspired by the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower crossing from Plymouth to Plymouth. 
Well, now we're talking a whole other story. There's no humans on board, so we've got a ship that's going to make decisions on its own. It doesn't have anybody sort of in a control room pressing buttons or anything like that. I did 33 and a half years in the Navy. I'd never seen anything like that in my life. There's no guarantee of success for any number of reasons. It's the beginning of something new. Have we thought of every possible situation they could encounter? Autonomous vessels, like the Mayflower, will really allow us to collect as much data as possible. What are we going to discover? What does the future hold for this type of research? The single biggest challenge is the ocean itself. So no ship has ever been built that can survive whatever the ocean could throw at it. Leveraging technology, autonomy, machine learning and AI is going to open up the door to a new era of ocean science. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, folks. Um, it is an absolute pleasure to be here this evening talking about the Mayflower Autonomous Ship, a project that I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be part of and co-leading some science experiments on board this futuristic vessel. Um, so this evening, I will be taking you through uh, a story about this ship, uh, how it came about, um, its you know, the history as well, uh, just touching on that lightly. Um, going into some of the detail that makes this ship so unique and so special with the autonomy, uh, and then concluding with some of the science on board the vessel. Uh, so I hope you enjoy um, the talk this evening. Uh, the video you just watched is from the um, Uncharted docuseries, which you can watch online. Uh, that was just a trailer. There's five episodes. Uh, episode six is uh, to be aired and launched next week, uh, which documents this quite extraordinary story in even more detail than you'll hear this evening. So before I kick off, just a bit of an introduction um, to myself, as um, uh, you're all new to me this evening. Um, I am a um, research staff member at IBM Research based in Hursley, um, so Winchester, uh, on the south coast of the UK. Uh, I'm an emerging technology specialist and software engineer, um, and I have a background in oceanography. I moved to Southampton to do my master's at the Oceanography Centre down there. Uh, and then following that sort of found my way into IBM where I worked as a software engineer uh, and now in this wonderful part of the uh, organization, uh, IBM Research. And I've had the pleasure of co-leading, um, leading now actually because my colleague who I was working very closely with has recently left the company. Uh, so leading now the, the Mayflower, uh, the science projects on board this really special unique ship. And I should say it's a delight to be here in person this evening. <laughs> so I've done so many of these talks, uh, but this is my first one in person. And also, as you can see, there is a time limit to the amount of time that I can be here talking uh, or have these opportunities. So I was yeah, very pleased to, to take up and, uh, <laughs> and actually be here in person this evening. And <laughs> this is my own personal project I have uh, I've worked on. So <laughs> and actually, I should mention as well, I will unfortunately have to um, leave fairly soon after my talk. Um, so, you know, get your questions in in the discussion uh, and any follow-up questions I can't touch on this evening, um, please connect on LinkedIn or, or you know, um, reach out to me other ways, um, just so I can not be home too late this evening. <laughs> okay, um, so the Mayflower Autonomous Ship. This is the first full-size, fully autonomous research vessel to attempt a crossing of the Atlantic Ocean. What makes the ship so unique is that full research platform that is on board. It's not, there are other autonomous vessels outside uh, that do exist, uh, but there's none that actually cover this full capability of um, research that's going on board because of the size of this ship, which makes it unique. There are examples of um, autonomous um, buoys or, or buoys, if you're working with the, the folks in the US, uh, that, that sit in the ocean and monitor to collect data. Uh, you know, there's a lot of autonomy there. There's wave gliders, there's other examples, but nothing Nothing on the scale of the Mayflower. And this is a ship that is navigating by itself. So there is no human crew, there's no space for human crew, which means you can completely redesign it, completely rethink it. And its mission is the science, so the data that it's collecting about the ocean. And without humans on board, it means that we can dedicate all of that space to the science and the technology that's actually packed inside the ship. And where did it all begin? So this is Brett Faneff. Brett is a, uh, the director of a small uh, company based in Plymouth, 
who uh, build submarines. Um, and Brett has a background in, in archaeology and a kind of um, passion for, um, you know, history and, and, and the ocean as well. And about five years ago now, there was some discussion about how to celebrate the 400th anniversary of the original Mayflower crossing the Atlantic. And a, a conversation around from Plymouth City Council was, let's build a replica. Let's build, you know, the same ship again, but, you know, brand new. And Brett said, that's a silly idea. There's one already there in the States, in Massachusetts. Um, and we should be thinking about the next 400 years, not, you know, focusing on the past solely. So why don't we build an autonomous vessel that will be about the next 400 years and about tackling some of the challenges that we have now, uh, rather than looking back at the past. And that is how the Mayflower Autonomous Ship, the concept was born uh, from this man, uh, Brett Faneff. And just to emphasize the innovation in 400 years, you know, this is where we've come. This is uh, the Mayflower uh, 1620, and 400 years later, uh, what we have now, a futuristic design uh, that's completely different. And it really is quite striking when you put those images side by side, you know, that represents human innovation and what we're doing now, what we're pioneering and what is, you know, our mission today. 400 years ago, it was about, new worlds taking pilgrims um you know tackling this ocean with with wood and with sails now we're doing it with technology and with a completely different mission as well so why is this important why is this a um an interesting area to be working in and why is ibm involved ibm is the technology partner and the science partner for this project um the marine industry and the, eco, the ocean ecosystem, uh, ocean economy, sorry, um, actually contributes to um, three trillion US dollars by, or estimated by uh, 2030. Um, marine transport takes up, up around 90% of global trade. There is a huge amount of economic, um, you know, value we have from the ocean. It's our travel, it's our trade, it's our transport. You know, there's so much in the ocean that we just take for granted every day. Uh, that's, but really, it touches all of us, whether you realize it or not. And it's under threat. So again, I mentioned that other key mission about collecting data uh, that the, the autonomous Mayflower autonomous ship is, is focused on. And another aspect is that the ocean remains vastly unexplored. There's only 80% of it that's currently mapped uh, in terms of the bathymetry. Um, you know, there's a, <laughs> um, you, you've heard Brett say there that we know more about the surface of the moon than we do about our own ocean and our own planet. And, you know, there is a huge concern about the health of our oceans. And one of the things that is a positive about this project is that recognition that there is a willingness to change and to you know, have these projects where we are looking to collect data so that we can better understand. Uh, and I'll talk a lot more about that later on in my talk. Um, but yeah, it is a, a small ship, uh, but with the potential to change the world with these you know, three angles really to the story that we're gonna hear this evening. There's the technology on board the ship that's enabling the autonomy. Um, so fully autonomous, crewless, full size, as I mentioned, um, with an AI captain on board. <laughs> It's science goals about creating a cost effective platform for collecting data across the ocean at large scale uh, and also that historical aspect as well, you know, recognizing our past, but with a vision uh, to the future. And this is the mission. This is the, the, the Mayflower's um, goal, what it will be setting out to do. Travel from Plymouth, UK, uh, replicating the original voyage of the Mayflower to Plymouth, US. And actually, it did, uh, it has had an attempt already. I'm not sure how many folks in the room are aware of the, sort of the story so far, uh, but in June this year, the Mayflower autonomous ship set out on its maiden voyage. Uh, unfortunately, although everything was going really well, the autonomy was really working effectively, AI systems were, were all working really well, the ship was able to navigate some really challenging situations. Uh, unfortunately, there was a very small mechanical failure 
which ironically was exactly what was predicted uh, by Brett, who we saw earlier, uh, was going to go wrong. If there was going to be something, it was going to be something small and something human, uh, you know, something that a human could have probably come and fixed in no problem, with no problem at all. But this challenge of this autonomous platform is you have to kind of completely rethink these things that are potentials to go wrong. And unfortunately, it was something that um, it was probably one of the, the least expensive parts on the ship. And uh, it, it caused a problem that, that the AI couldn't resolve by itself. But it was recovered and it did uh, was successfully brought back to Plymouth. So that was June this year. Uh, the ship over the summer has been kind of um, repaired and, and um, you know, parts replaced, um, ready to go back to start doing sea trials, to start building up that confidence again in the AI, the new components that are put in, and to hone the science experiments that are on board with a view to do another attempt to cross the Atlantic next summer. But I think it does show more than anything just how challenging an endeavor it is to cross an ocean you know it, it was estimated it would take about three weeks to do uh, the ship got um three days into its journey uh, before it had a technical issue or a mechanical issue um so you know it's not it's not an easy thing to do and this project is about exploration it's about exploring and experimenting so you know yes it's a setback but it's not the end of the road by any means and you know we're still looking to um continue the innovation uh, through the sea trials over the winter and hopefully achieving a successful Atlantic crossing uh, next summer or spring. And I mentioned as well about the data that the ship will be collecting. And one of the really exciting aspects around this project is the connection with the Ocean Decade. So the Ocean Decade is a is starting uh, started in January this year, and for the next ten years is an initiative um, actually in recognition of some of the challenges that our world's oceans are facing with a consortium of government, uh, governments, um, academia, industry, all coming together from a global um, group to recognize some of those issues that are threatening our world's oceans with a goal of changing and creating sustainable ways for managing um, and developing our oceans in a, in a sustainable fashion. So recognizing things like our oceans becoming more polluted, uh, stormier, less productive, increased sea level, and what the Mayflower is setting out to do, the Mayflower Autonomous Ship is setting out to do, is to collect data on many of these aspects to you know, facilitate how in the future we're going to be able to actually better monitor, better understand, make better decisions about sustainable management and development of our world's oceans. And as I mentioned, you know, we all depend on the ocean. Um, you know, that's not just people in this room, it's, it's globally. There's so many people living on the coast who depend on the ocean for their work. Um, there's obviously our trade, our travel, the food that we eat. It has such an important impact. Climate as well. Obviously, the ocean regulates our climate and plays a major part there. So sustaining and um, protecting our oceans is, is, is so vital. <laughs> and I'm just I'm delighted that we're at a point where we can use technology to be able to start to make a real difference here. So some of the science on board the Mayflower, uh, we have a number of collaborators that we're working with. We're not working in isolation by any means. Um, you know, this is a really collaborative project that we have a lot of academic institutes, uh, other industry partners as well, um, helping and supporting us with the science on board the ship. And these are just some of the experiments we have on board that I'm going to touch on in a bit more detail as we go through the talk this evening. But to bring it back to the autonomy, so the what is it that makes this Mayflower autonomous ship uh, run on its own be crewless but have no humans on board well there is a huge myriad of, of innovation packed into that small vessel that's making it possible and the key things are really around that situational awareness so the boat actually having a good understanding of what is going on around it using things like radar uh, computer vision uh, doing kind of uh, visual recognition of obstacles on a, a floating um, uh, you know um, ocean as it were um, so all of that information being fed in and calculated and analysed in real time on board the ship. Um, so that's why we, we, you know, we've named this the AI captain, because it really is making those decisions in real time on the vessel. There's not a, someone with a control stick or, you know, there's not necessarily communication connection all the time. So it has to be able to actually, uh, you know, travel on its own, uh, make those decisions out at sea. Um, safely as well <laughs> um, so you know there is a lot there a lot of um, technology that's making this possible 
Um, so as I mentioned, um, you know, there isn't always connectivity with the ship. So we have a kind of navigation system with the AI captain on board uh, running things like um, IBM Edge Application Manager. Uh, so containerized workloads that are running on the vessel using um, NVIDIA um, uh, Xavier devices, so small, low powered machines. So obviously you've got a lot of power constraints uh, on, on a vessel like this. You can't just plug it into a mains. It's got to have its own power with it. Uh, it's got a... Um, uh, solar panels but with a backup diesel generator uh, which actually runs and powers all the computers on board then we're um, transmitting when we can via satellite that data back to base using ibm public cloud um, we're sharing lots of that data on the mas 400 portal mas400.com um, just because we want to have as wide a reach as possible so we're really keen to share as much data as possible in real time where we can um, and then using things like weather data as well to help inform decisions um, and also um, a big control center with the power CPU and IBM power machines um, running a lot of the systems uh, actually back in base. And how it's making those decisions. So I mentioned about uh, using the visual recognition. That's one of the key aspects that's been trained on uh, thousands and hundreds of thousands of images all collected from um, various different locations about actually kind of what what the different uh, obstacles that it might encounter might be so a lot of human hours have definitely gone into that side of things of labeling the training data um, but to a point where the ship is now able to so safely uh, navigate and i can attest to that having gone out um, on a rib in uh, plymouth sound uh, whilst the mayflower was doing some sea trials and we kind of, um, sort of sta stationed ourselves uh, in one area where the Mayflower was elsewhere, uh, only for the skipper to then tell me that we were an obstacle for the Mayflower to avoid. <laughs> so the ship sort of travels slowly and then sure enough, veers off course, thankfully. <laughs> so yeah, I can vouch for that, that it is able to actually see these um, obstacles. Uh, there's obviously the, the AIS system as well, the automatic identification system, all feeding that information in to enable it to make those decisions on the fly. Um, and Another interesting aspect to that decision making process is this idea of it having a kind of hierarchy of decision making process. So at the very bottom, we have the uh, basic needs that the ship needs to achieve. So avoiding collisions, staying safe, uh, maintaining a, a safe speed given the uh, weather conditions. And then next, it's looking to actually uh, understand its kind of global situation and follow a particular set of rules to maybe optimize and take the best path possible. And then finally, it's looking to collect data uh, as it travels. And you know, ideally in the future, it will be looking to actually uh, identify for itself where the best places to collect data were. You know, maybe it's an area, maybe it's, it's following the sun, so it's enabling its solar panels to keep it powered. And then most, you know, that, that's the sort of efficient strategy at that time. Or perhaps the um, hydrophone on board has detected some interesting uh, acoustics and it's going to travel that way and follow it, you know, all feeding back into the AI, making those decisions on board the vessel. Um, and as I mentioned, there's a kind of whole sort of um, set of steps that uh, the situation understanding of the vessel have to go through to finally make a, a, a sort of action on board the ship. So once we've fed in all of that sensor data uh, on onto the ship, so cameras, AIS, satellite um, information, uh, GPS as well, as well as weather data, obviously being very key. Uh, we're then able to make take that unstructured data, convert it into something structured. And then, find, and then um, secondly, we're using IBM Operational Decision Manager uh, to actually implement the collision regulations. So these are kind of the, the rules of the road uh, when you're out at sea uh, that actually define uh, how you're going to be, um, you know, how you can operate. Because it's not just as simple as, you know, there's a, a few other boats right, I'm just going to stop, like that isn't even allowed, you have to still safely navigate, there's a set of rules that have to be followed. And interestingly, operational decision manager is a technology that's used typically in the financial industry, because it has very clear um, tra um, transparency and kind of trace traceability. So you can actually see because it's a logic based rule system that's implementing this, this whole set of very complex rules. There isn't just one answer that comes out of that um, system. Um, so given for a given situation, uh, we then need a system to actually optimize and that's IBM CPLEX uh, optimization uh, tool that actually takes from all of those different decisions, right, what's the best course in action here, what's the safest thing to do, what's the optimum decision to make. 
And then finally, that's all running uh, using um, Red Hat's RHEL, um, where uh, the, the decisions are actually um, verified and validated before then actually executing some uh, change of direction or speed, you know, some action on the vessel itself. Um, and then, yeah, there's a sort of list of other IBM technology that's that's important as well. Uh, Watson Studio, Cloud Object Storage, Acoustic Insights that I'm going to talk a bit more about in the, the Acoustic project. So yeah, pack full of tech, uh, lots of it IBM. <laughs> Not all of it, but lots of it. <laughs> um, cool, okay, so changing gear a little bit now, I'm going to talk a bit more about the science on board the Mayflower. And this is the bit that I am really passionate about. This is the area that I'm leading a team at IBM Research on um, and is really tying together my passions and interests, my oceanography and my uh, software engineering. So it's kind of the perfect sweet spot and why I get so excited about this project. <laughs> Uh, we have a number of different experiments on board from um, listening to marine mammals uh, to looking at uh, um, pollution within the ocean so chemical characteristics of the sea of seawater potentially looking at ph as well um, exploring sea level and wave heights uh, calculating wave energy there's also some other experiments on board that we are not involved with but equally as interesting uh, analyzing and looking at microplastics uh, using uh, microscopes on board again to look at um, uh, marine algae and uh, fluorescence as well a, a instrument on board uh, to look at fluorescence and all of these systems are running you know in a humanless environment so they have to be uh, very reliable very um, fault tolerant as well <laughs> and able to kind of adapt to, to the situation that, that's that's there there's a lot of sensors on board as well to make all this science happen um so these are sort of the yeah the touch points where the data you know is first fed into the ship uh with things like high definition video uh that we're using for the calculating the wave energy I'll talk about a bit more about that in a moment um looking at temperature conductivity and depth a sort of basic oceanographic measurement that you would always take on a on an oceanographic mission um gps um gnss global navigation satellite system um accelerometers um a hydrophone I mentioned see um, carbon dioxide O2 as well oxygen so you know all, all sorts of system of sensors on board the ship and again as I said at the beginning this is the one of the unique features of the Mayflower it is this full size platform that enables us to actually pack all of this on board the ship you know we can go on one mission and collect all of this data uh, in a, a way that for a traditional research vessel wouldn't be quite as feasible. We can go to more remote places. We can go to dangerous places. You know, the ocean is a very harsh environment. And with a ship like this, with this many sensors on board, it really is opening up what we're able to do in terms of data collection for, for um, you know, the ocean. Uh, so yeah, to go into a bit more detail on the experiments, <laughs> we have, first of all, uh, IBM Hypertaste. So this is a fantastic device uh, that has been developed by a team in Zurich. Um, there it is a palm, well, originally it was a palm sized um, sensor, um, AI powered sensor for doing uh, chemical characteriz characterizations of liquids. The idea being you'd have a glass uh, of water or uh, whiskey even or, or wine, it was <laughs> been uh, used for, uh, originally developed for industry, and you'd place this little sensor on the glass with a little sensor reading, and it would use, uh, use um, electrical currents to detect. Um, based on uh, training data and a machine learning model that have been trained on what those chemical characterizations of the liquid were. So, for instance, you could do things like detect um, uh, like fraudulent brand of water or the quality of whiskey or the age or something like that, you know, some characteristic about the liquid. The team have tirelessly worked to completely redesign this um, device originally developed for industry to make it seaworthy and to make it uh, you know uh, compatible with an autonomous vessel and what's quite ironic and funny about this is that they're based in Zurich uh, so if you know anything about geography they don't have a lot of access to seawater so I think they had artificial seawater shipped to their lab uh, in order to test and to work on this <laughs> um, so we're, yeah, we're really excited about this experiment because it was, is yeah, just so unique in the fact it's taken something that's originally developed for industry and just completely reimagined how it's going to work in this setting by chemical engineers who don't have any knowledge of oceanography, <laughs> hence our partners and why we've had to collaborate so closely with universities and other, other uh, folks. 
Um, but yeah, so this sensor um, will be on board the ship and it will be looking at some of the um, characteristics of seawater, uh, things like magnesium. Uh, do I have another chart that shows? Uh, I do, yeah. Um, magnesium, uh, calcium uh, concentrations. We can infer things about pH as well. Um, we can provide a calibration mechanism for uh, alternative pH sensors. Uh, typically, you might on an oceanographic uh, mission have one method of measuring pH you wouldn't then have a way of calibrating that so it might be skewed and you wouldn't necessarily know this is a different mechanism for measuring that pH using the um, uh, electrodes uh, to detect uh, the characteristics of the seawater uh, so then you're able to actually verify your readings um, and yeah we've got a couple of pictures here of, of some of the work in the lab that's been going on so kind of constructing this this new way of, of putting together these sensors uh, there's a system that actually enables the liquid to be sampled uh, and flushed through so you're getting a clean sample every time so a whole lot of kind of robotics and engineering all packed into this one experiment that's on board uh, so next up we have a kind of pair of, of physical oceanography uh, oceanographic experiments based around measuring and exploring and looking at uh, sea surface uh, wave height, so the open ocean waves and the sea, sea surface and um, the, the wave height that's out in the open ocean. So at the moment, this is only we're only able to calibrate this using a sparse network of tidal gauges uh, that give us an indication uh, of, of sea surface and wave height. But and there's not much known uh, out in the open ocean in the interior. So with using a uh, accelerometer inertial measurement units so to look at the pitch and the role of the vessel uh, we're able to calibrate satellite readings of um of sea surface and wave height and that's really important for doing things like climate modeling um, which interestingly enough is actually the other part of my day job that i'm doing at the moment <laughs> so i'm getting to use some data that would benefit from this work which yeah again is really interesting um, the second um, physical oceanographic experiment we have on board is to calculate uh, in real time uh, wave energy um, that, that's of the energy of the waves that are actually hitting the vessel using high definition video feed. Um, this is very much a kind of work in progress. It's, it's an experiment as again as they all are, uh, but this one really is an unknown whether it will be possible to do this calculation actually in real time. Uh, and the benefit of this, um, you know, a study like this will be to sort of see. Um, you know, can you actually uh, get a good understanding of wave energy uh, out in the open ocean? Um, you know, it could be useful for things like um, wave energy, um, tidal energy infrastructure in the future. Um, yeah, so <laughs> another really valuable and interesting experiment. Um, next up, we have the acoustic project. So this again is the one that I get, I'm lucky enough to get to work on uh, most of my time on the Mayflower projects. Uh, so here we are listening out, uh, we have a hydrophone attached to the bottom of the vessel and we are listening uh, for marine mammal vocalizations. Uh, so here you can see a dolphin uh, you know, following the ship and, and bow, uh, riding the waves in the front of the boat. They're such playful animals, they're so inevitable to come into contact with the Mayflower. So we thought we'd take the opportunity to uh, put a hydrophone on board, um, so it's a microphone placed just under the hull of the vessel, which uh, is far from ideal, but it's the best you can do with an autonomous ship. Uh, so there's a lot of noise, a lot of background noise, a lot of sounds from the waves, um, engine noise as well. And we're using that um, along with IBM Acoustic Insights, so a technology that's been developed um, by colleagues in Yorktown, um, uh, IBM kind of research headquarters over a couple of uh, a decade or so um, to actually enable um, training and deployment of machine learning models around acoustic and, and signals, signal um, uh, analysis. Um, so we're using this to see if we can actually detect uh, the presence of marine mammal vocalizations and potentially can we then explore and from those sounds using our machine learning model what the species is. It's not easy particularly with the very, very noisy data, uh, but we're having a lot of fun uh, <laughs> experimenting and working with it. Uh, these are some examples of some of the data we've been analysing. So uh, these are um, some whale calls, some uh, right whale calls. As you can see the, in the spectrogram here, uh, we've got the frequency on the axis and then time along the bottom, uh, and the colour is the sort of the intensity of the sound. So you can see there's these quite distinct patterns so you'd think that would be something that a, um, an AI system machine learning model would be able to distinguish. 
Um, and we have seen that is the case for um, clean data, but we're not working with clean data. We're working with very noisy, uh, challenging data. Uh, the Mayflower actually, uh, hasn't ever, uh, hasn't have, had um, been out to sea long enough to have many encounters. So we don't have a, a ready-made data set from this ship. Uh, with lots of nice encounters of all different species. So we're having to be quite in ingenious, what's the word? <laughs> innovative about how we bring together a, a new data set to train a model that we hope or expect uh, will perform as well as a human uh, would classifying these sounds. So as all of these projects, it's very much a work in progress. <laughs> um, and following the um, uh, first Atlantic crossing, we, where, um, we were able to gather quite a bit of data, um, less noisy data as the ship was out on its own, it didn't have support boats with it. Uh, so we're now reviewing that data and we're starting to learn more about, you know, how we can improve this experiment and how, what we can do going forward. Um, cool, okay, so that was uh, sort of an overview on some of the key experiments that IBM research have been involved with. Um, but there's a really important point that sort of ties it all together, which is the, um, the science pod. Sorry, I clicked the wrong thing. There we go. <laughs> the uh, IBM Research Science Pod. And this is our uh, custom built um, edge computing platform that is deployed to the vessel. So it's sort of a small suitcase sized um, piece of kit um, running um, Raspberry Pis. So, you know, 20 quid. Uh, pieces of kit. We've got four of them. Uh, so it's nothing substantial. And these Raspberry Pis are running all of those experiments. You know, so there's a lot of, um, you know, we're getting a lot of work out of these, these uh, devices, but also the workloads that we're running on are all very efficiently uh, developed. Um, you know, we're not doing model training, we're doing um, AI inference, machine learning inference on these uh, devices at the edge. The important thing is that they're really low powered, which is obviously, you know, essential for this uh, autonomous setting for the Mayflower. Um, is anybody in the room familiar with Node Red? Oh my goodness, okay, you need to look into it. Uh, so Node Red is um, a wonderful uh, piece of technology, piece of software. I think I'm biased because it was invented by some of my colleagues, uh, but it's typically used in, in Internet of Things development. So when you want to connect up devices uh, or do any rapid prototyping but basically it's sort of a low code environment lots of, sort of drag and drop um, but brilliant for this experiment so what we've been able to do is use node red uh, to very quickly um, set up a system that is actually orchestrating all of our experiments um, keeping the system running um, and keeping everything kind of going in a very um, i don't want to say low tech but uh, quick and easy way of doing it so yeah, there's one takeaway from this evening. Let's say look up Node Red and have a play. <laughs> it's a very, very good piece of tech. Um, but yes, so the science pod, and this in itself is really um, a key bit of innovation. Um, you know, we're, we're running these experiments on these low power devices in a very harsh environment. And it's actually sort of showcasing what is possible um, out, out at sea. And what we envisage as well is that the, this science pod, it doesn't necessarily have to be tied uh, to the Mayflower, to this autonomous vessel. The blueprint is very much applicable to other um, areas, you know, whether it's out at sea, in space, the back of a factory somewhere that's completely inaccessible and has rubbish internet, you know, any environment that is harsh, remote, uh, and poorly connected to the network, you know, this system is, is ideal for, for running those workloads, those AI workloads. Um, I had my slides mixed up, so there's one more experiment to touch on, <laughs> which is the um, domain specific uh, system for autonomous navigation system and what this is is an experiment around actually developing a, um, a new um, domain specific system on a chip, but in a third of the time that it typically takes to design these, these systems so um, what these devices are are basically um, specially designed um, compute components that are specific to um, a particular purpose, so it might be an autonomous car or you know, some specific um, niche area that this chip is actually custom fitted for and custom designed for. But those de that design process can typically can take 10 years now. So, you know, point of design to point of delivery, your specs have changed. <laughs> so uh, this experiment is actually focused on looking at a new way of innovating and taking up just a fraction of the time that it typically takes now to develop these systems. 
and the team are using a uh, a real-time um, hazard detection system to actually um, you know um, demonstrate the capability of the, this new design process um, and what this system is doing this hazard detection system is actually looking to um, fill in the gaps for the computer vision so while the computer vision system for navigation has been trained on thousands and thousands of images it hasn't been trained on a parachuter coming down or a giraffe uh, appearing out of the ocean you know <laughs> those bizarre edge cases that you wouldn't have think thought to train your machine model learn machine learning model on this system is looking to fill in those gaps and demonstrate that uh, that new technique of uh, delivering these uh, system on a chip um, innovations in, in a fraction of that time uh, so yeah so that is kind of covering all of the science experiments um, I'll now kind of touch on um, the more fun side of the project so um, another really exciting aspect of this the Mayflower autonomous ship project is this uh, reach and this engagement that we've been fortunate enough to have the story is so compelling we've got the technology we've got the history we've got the science you know there's so many people that are interested in the mayflower and we've been able to um, not only develop a really compelling um web platform or we uh, website uh, we've got the dashboard we've got all of the data from the missions and the sea trials um, we've also got a really fun playful uh conversation assistant chatbot uh, this is arty the um a seven legged octopus who's the kind of mascot for the Mayflower. And I was debating this evening whether to wear my IBM research t shirt or my t shirt with my little arty logo on, which you can buy Mayflower t shirts if anybody uh, wants to. I'll, I'll share the link for that one after the talk. Um, but yeah, so arty is there to help engage as wide an audience as possible. Uh, obviously, you know, with a bit of an, a, a, an eye on younger, younger children, younger audience, and um, to get as many people as possible engaged in, you know, the issues that the ship is looking to address, collecting ocean data, uh, protecting our world's oceans and, and a sustainable development for, for oceans in general. So it's been a fantastic opportunity to, you know, take that reach as wide as we possibly can. And that's, you know, something that's been really successful. <laughs> Slight kind of sadder point is, you know, the day that we had the ship, because like, so there was quite a few delays uh, during the year, obviously pandemics, can't be blamed for that originally the ship was um set to launch on the um actual anniversary of the mayflower so september 19th i think 20 uh, 20 um 2020 but due to the pandemic uh, it was delayed until the spring a new date was set uh, and unfortunately delayed again due to weather um but a number of school children had that date in their diary and the emails that came through from all these disappointed kids who were, what do you mean it hasn't set sail? We've got our school project, we want to, you know, and it, oh, it's heartbreaking. So, you know, we've had to make sure that we're on it with our communications and our dates and our, you know, we we're trying not to set, you know, it's, it's the sea, right? You can't be held accountable for high waves or, you know, the engineering team having a disaster. So you have to be quite forgiving. Um, that's why we're saying the next attempt at the crossing will be spring, summer, next year was <laughs> hopefully not upsetting too many school children second time around um, but it is showing that there are people engaged all around the world um, and yeah as i mentioned so we've got the um the um website but there's also docu series so from the video i showed at the beginning of the um the session five episodes so far six to come out next week 20 minutes or so long um, produced by some Americans, so very dramatic. And, you know, they love the setbacks, any kind of challenge we've faced that, yeah, come on, give us, tell us more. Yeah. Um, so it's really, it's, it's a really good piece of, uh, piece of work that just, um, yeah, captures as wide a, an audience as possible. And, you know, I feature it a few times, just hoping to get across that point that the ocean impacts us all. Um, we need to have these devices, these systems in place uh, to help us learn more about the ocean. Um, and yeah, I'm actually not far off the end of my talk, so I've kind of run through things fairly quickly. But um, to close off, I wanted to touch on the fact that this is a real sort of um, success story in it being a, a real partnership of IBM as the technology and the science partner here, uh, but also um, with the, these two very happy men uh, standing on top of the Mayflower. So I introduced Brett Faneff at the start. Uh, the co-founder uh, and uh, board member of Promare, the non-profit research organization responsible for the Mayflower, and his uh, colleague, uh, Don Scott, 
you know, they've been friends for kind of several decades and Don um, runs uh, Marine AI, who are the company who've actually, we've partnered with IBM, who've partnered with IBM to develop the AI captain. Uh, and I should say, so Brett is, yeah, I mentioned before, um, is the director of MSUBS, the small submarine company in Plymouth. And these two men, you know, they're looking <laughs> that happy because, uh, you know, their ship is about to cross the Atlantic or attempts to cross the Atlantic. This was the summer last year, or this year, sorry, earlier in the year. Um, and it really has been a partnership. You know, they couldn't have, you know, got where they are without us, without IBM coming on board five years ago. Uh, and we couldn't be telling this wonderful story without their innovation and without their, their collaboration and their partnership. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's been a, an absolute joy to work with them and, and to, to be, you know, with such kind of um, pioneers of, of innovation, people who aren't scared to take risks and to, um, you know, take a chance because there is every chance that the ship won't make it across. But if it doesn't, it is still paved the way and it's opened up this whole conversation. It's, you know, industry um, to maritime law and regulation had to be changed. You know, there wasn't a, a precedent before now of autonomous ships going out to sea. I think I posted on LinkedIn earlier today about this talk and someone said to me, uh, it's a shame next year, it won't be the only ship. And to be honest, that's a good thing. You know, <laughs> if there's other um, companies, other technology on board in this space, that is absolutely fine with me. You know, this the ship is as much about that Atlantic crossing um, as it is about, um, you know, opening the, the floodgates, as it were, pun intended there. There's, there's too many puns <laughs> in this project in general. Um, yeah, then, then that's a really good thing from my point of view. So finishing seven minutes early apologies um, but thank you so much for listening this evening i'm going to put that down to only ever doing this talk sat down in front of my computer so <laughs> um but it's been a pleasure to be here this evening you've been a, a very kind lovely audience haven't had any heckles or any nasty questions so they're still to come aren't they <laughs> um, but yeah there's lots of places you can follow uh, learn more about the mayflower i mentioned the docuseries there's also a podcast um, which you can uh, have a listen to on Spotify or whatever other um, podcast platforms you use, all the social channels as well. So, um, you know, please follow along, join the story, join the conversation and, and be part of things. And uh, yeah, there is more to come. You know, this is just the start. As I mentioned, the ocean decade. My hope, you know, is that we'll be here in, you know, five, six years time still talking about the Mayflower, but the next, you know, the more innovation that's, that's gone, um, you know, hopefully will be, um, getting to share about the positive journey that it's had over the Atlantic and all the missions it's got to go on, all the, the other ships that are actually joining it. So it's got a kind of network of, of partner vessels to share its data and it's actually making a, a real scientific um, contribution, helping us change and shape uh, the future of our world's oceans. So yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Rosie, that was wonderful. <laughs> Please sit down. <laughs> Thank you. And let's ask you more. <laughs> David, we have a number of questions. Oh, Jack. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, hello. Yes? All right. Um, is there a way you can increase the volume? But let me just ask you, do we have a number of questions that have come in or should I kick off? Do you have any question questions? Good. Okay, fine. Do you want to go for it and ask? And I'm, and I'm aware that we must let Rosie go <laughs> fairly, fairly soon before she goes in another direction. Uh, yes. Yes, of course. Um, can we take this lady's question? I might have missed it, but if I understand, this ship does not. Uh, too soon they hear, hear me. Um, this ship doesn't go underneath, it just stays floating. Okay. Yeah. So everything is underneath for the pictures and so on, that you have special cameras or whatever of sounding. Or... Yeah, so there isn't cameras underneath, uh, there's cameras on top of the ship. Um, so you can see um, just here. Uh, there's six cameras around uh, the top of the ship so that's what allows the for the navigation system to take place um that and it, there's uh, that i think it's an acoustic doppler profile um so sending a signal down uh, that isn't something that's currently on board but potentially would be relevant for the sea surface and wave height 
and wave energy experiments. Um, so it might be something to, to um, add on. It's kind of being discussed at the moment. I presume all your technology might be transferred to help, uh, I mean, ordinary ships to, to become more secure and, and some of them, I mean, not immediately because it can be very costly, but I presume there is certain element that would help, uh, you know, to make the maritime traffic much more secure. Yeah, yeah, potentially, yeah, there's uh, currently now, you know, the something ships of opportunity it's called where uh, these ships are out of sea and they're just collecting data for environmental purposes or scientific purposes just because they're there um but there isn't the same capability there isn't ai there isn't they're not doing the data processing on the devices themselves so there's a lot more innovation that could be done in that space for sure thank you on that note rosie i was uh, interested let's say to see that the route map you had across the atlantic passed not only the uh, the uh, um, Mid-Atlantic Ridge, but also the Titanic site. Yeah. So, are you sure it doesn't have submarine capability? <laughs> no, but um, the um, I mentioned Brett uh, with his interest in archaeology. That he's not alone. There's a the, the um, scientific chief scientific officer as well has a real passion for archaeology. So, the Mayflower Wood autonomous ship may very well be stopping at some historic uh, nautical sites. The Challenger expedition as well. It's the 200th anniversary for that this year or next year. So, yeah, that's a, a is a feature. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, um, I'm going to throw in another one. It's going and it's packed with scientific instruments. One thing you didn't major on was the engine. Mm. Yes, so you, does probably, it have one? yes, it does, probably because I don't know too much about it. I know that it's, um, I did say that the ship is solar, has solar panels and it has some uh, solar power capability, uh, but there's a backup diesel generator to power the engine because um, if you ask anybody who's crossed an ocean, you can't do it on at the moment on renewable energy alone and there just isn't the technology or the capability so you have to have uh, something like a diesel engine to get you across um, if the ship was redesigned for um, you know coastal surveys coastal exploration then renewable energy solar um, even potentially wind there are some really interesting designs like sail drone is another example of you know one of the ships we might see at sea next year uh, so th there is possibility for sure okay. um, another question in the Hi, it's Liz. Um, I'm interested in the test data. Um, where, where did you get that to kind of build all the other the sort of the AI and, and and then sort of the second part to that question is, as you said at the moment, um, you're getting sort of some parts of, of data. And can you talk a little bit more about what data you're using to close the gaps? Uh, to sort of carry on testing the AI? Yeah, for sure. I can definitely talk to the acoustic project for that um, because uh, you're right, there wasn't that ready made data set for us to go and use. Uh, so we had to use, um, we had sort of four different data sets from different data sources. Uh, so one from a survey um, in the um, between England, Scotland and Iceland um, from a, a big traditional research vessel, another one from a, a wave glider in the English Channel, I think, and then a, another two data sets from Hawaii uh, using a wave glider again. So completely different data sets. And what we had to do was actually mix in the sort of sound signal from the Mayflower. So that unique signal from this ship, and this is just the audio data I'm talking about, um, to train the acoustic models. Um, so we mixed in that sound from the Mayflower with these um, different data sets that had these really interesting vocalizations and different marine mammal signals. Uh, so the result was this um, kind of mix of fairly noisy data, but with these sort of um, uh, mammal signals within it. Um, but it's very much an experiment and what we're anticipating is that we'll need to kind of review and um, go around iterate we have to have um, still kind of marine mam um, yeah, marine biology experts validating and reviewing our data so then you know particularly with the um, deep neural networks you have to have really high quality data um, so it is a big challenge but yeah we're addressing that with um, you know expertise uh, and also, you know, looking to train our models as, as best we can. So, yeah, work in progress. 
Another question here. Uh, I'm Carsten. Uh, I have a question regarding like the range of the ship is very limited and you know uh, it's going on this trip to the to the US. It, it's even it takes a lot of data on that trip. You know, in order to to kind of monitor what's going on in the ocean, uh, it's very, very little input you have for that, uh, to, to monitor that, or you get to monitor that. I mean, even you get, you, you let it say for a thousand years. Um, my question is, I mean, wouldn't it be better to develop something that you could put on all the ships that are sailing around the world already, uh, you know, uh, or, or measuring points, or that there are a lot of measuring points already, like on, on the coast and mm -hmm. on the forest and, and so on. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, absolutely that the ship isn't the single answer. Um, and there are a lot of other systems out there that, that do um, a lot of data collection. But the thing is, for traditional research vessels, it's very expensive um, to take a boat full of scientists. You need the crew, the engineers. Uh, to get to a particular place. Um, I was fortunate enough, well, I say fortunate, <laughs> I did six weeks at sea in the North Sea, which was far from glamorous and was one of the reasons why I didn't become an oceanographer. Um, but it took two weeks to get there. Uh, we had two weeks of surveys and studying, um, there was some bad weather, and then two weeks to travel back. So that's six weeks of these researchers' time at sea. Um, these ships aren't ever going to replace traditional research missions you still need humans to actually do those you know really detailed intricate things that we can't get you know machines or robots to do um, but they are helping close the gap alongside a lot of the other systems so i mentioned the boys well, there's a network of floats argon floats uh, that are constantly continuing doing depth profiling and collecting data at certain points of the ocean but this is the ocean is huge even if you had all of these devices on all of the ships they're out there, it still wouldn't be enough. You still have gaps, you'd still need to, um, you know, to keep collecting that data to build your understanding. You know, we know so little about the ocean, um, it's so vital in how it um, drives our uh, planet's climate um, that, yeah, we just need, need more, we need more information. And the sh autonomous ships like the Mayflower are helping to close that gap. Okay, oh, another question in the room. Do say your name if you Hello, it's Karen. Thank you very much for your amazing talk. Oh, thank you. I just want to ask, um, in, the, in the case, um, hopefully not, of some sort of serious malfunction or some attack, cyber attack yes. or anything like that, can you actually control your ship? I mean, could it get sort of stolen from within without <laughs> you realising with all this high tech on board? You and just a, James Bond film, I think so, not always. <laughs> <laughs> and another tip, when you mentioned Switzerland, I just know, I remembered, I think they won the America's Cup. Oh, year, okay. So they're very good in <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, no, in answer to the question, uh, is it at risk when it's out at sea? Yes. Uh, I, should, I maybe I shouldn't admit that, but um, <laughs> there isn't comms necessarily. There isn't someone with a control stick. It, it can't be overridden if you can't connect to the ship. Um, so when it's out in the ocean, that is a possibility. But there's no humans on board. Often that is the most valuable thing that pirates or whatever are after. Uh, it's locked down. Um, it might be nice if there was kind of a self-destruct button or something. Um, but yeah, basically, um, sorry? It couldn't be, uh, well, there's not necessarily network because you're out at sea and you have to rely on satellite uh, comms. Um, so while there is the Iridium satellite network, you can't necessarily always rely on having data sent back that. You know, it's, it's, it's like being on Mars, right? You, maybe not quite the time delay, uh, but you have to think about this ship is out on its own. And even, I mean, that is a bizarre thought. When we were doing the sea trials, um, you didn't actually know kind of at times where the ship was, what it was encountering, what was going on until you got the feedback. Because, um, you know, there, might, there were some gaps. Um, then you did and you saw the video feed and you saw the cameras and you saw all the other information uh, there is typically always um ais which is the automatic identification system and that's really really low bandwidth and does typically have uh, full um, coverage over uh, different distances um so there is still that that's some aspects but 
yeah, basically it is, it is pretty vulnerable, but locked tight and limited value of cargo because no humans on board. <laughs> Amazing. Well, I'm surprised you haven't fitted it with the electrocution system <laughs> and also uh, machine guns and so on. But maybe that will come in later developments. <laughs> You did mention something about Raspberry Pi as well. Yeah. And I know from my contacts with UCL, University College London, that they did some research work as well in terms of ras Raspberry Pi and, use, uh, and its use. So it's great to hear that they're mm -hmm. being used. As yeah, low, absolutely. Low yeah, yeah, they're fantastic devices. And the fact that they're so inexpensive does you know, open up the chance to have this type of system on, on different ships. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a really great, great use of such low cost technology. Fabulous. Well, I know we've got some questions. Uh, sorry, Carsten, did you want to ask another yeah, one? Yeah, just one more. Uh, okay, hold on. You were talking about this, um, uh, that you uh, invented this. Uh, oh, Node Red. Uh, like for, for smelling or. Oh, hypertaste. Taste, taste, tasting. Hypertaste, yeah. Taste the tongue, electronic have tongue. Have you um, also looked at, I mean, you have like the Mars rover, uh, you have a lot of fancy devices mounted on that you know that can <laughs> have they found liquids on mars yeah i know it was sent there from here you know yeah. for, for years and years so <laughs> it's very limited how much much that's what it can carry mm -hmm. uh, the rocket sending there the equipment uh, but still you know they they are, have spent billions of dollars yeah making these uh, mission devices so haven't you used some of that uh, technology or look that you know whether because I'm sure it can also if it finds water on Mars you know and it's a kind of taste what was mm -hmm. it like <laughs> yeah quite water. possibly yeah I mean certainly and then there's some really interesting parallels with space exploration and ocean exploration you know we, I mentioned that the ocean is very unexplored um, and also you've got that network connectivity challenge as well um, but yes I haven't quite thought about the sensors that are maybe overlapping so yeah, great point, and maybe one to for future work. <laughs> maybe it could sense if there's any Mars rock that it finds <laughs> in the water. Yeah. <laughs> okay, David, I know you have some questions. Yes, on that. yes of course. Hi, so our first online question is from Tom Gill. When the Mayflower had the problem, what was that problem, the root cause and the fix? So the problem was a uh, flexible coupling. Um, I must admit, I don't really know what that is, but I think it's a small thing that fits together some part of the ship with another. Uh, the exhaust with the, uh, not sure. Uh, anyway, it was a very low cost um, part that just had a failure. Uh, I don't know the details. Um, that was kind of for the engineering team to explore and understand, uh, but yeah. It's been fixed. Uh, they've kind of changed that part. They've put in uh, a different components for the generator, um, you know, with the goal of it not happening again. But um, it is an interesting area that as much technology and innovation you can have, are you always going to be failed by your mechanical aspects? And there are some solutions. Uh, you can do lots of very rigorous asset management um, to, you know, really know what point this device went in and how many hours has it worked and can we predict when it's going to fail but it, it does still feel like there's an element you know that's potentially the bottleneck for autonomous ships um you know those mechanical aspects that a human could very easily solve um but we're very hopeful that the problem has been fixed and you know round two will, will be a lot more successful okay following on from that um jack has the question how will mechanical faults be dealt with in the future Will it always be necessary to bring it back to land to be fixed? Um, yeah, I guess it, in an ideal world, if there was a mechanical failure, um, the ship would, I mean, part of this time round was uh, the, the ship sort of decided to travel back for a number of days to um, facilitate the recovery and that sort of made the damage a bit worse. Uh, so it might be that in the future it's able to actually somehow safely navigate to an area that's easy to recover um, and that's therefore kind of minimizing its damage but it's probably one of those challenges as part of innovating around autonomous ships we need to think of ways that we can actually uh, you know support potential challenges around mechanical failures so opportunity to innovate there i'd say 
Okay, um, Therese has the question, how is the collected data transmitted back to base? Is that via cellular wireless or satellite? Yep, yep, so there's, there is a satellite connection that is um, prioritised for the most essential navigation data and it isn't necessarily always going to be there. Um, the science data is kind of at the bottom of that priority list because it's obviously non-essential to the mission. So as and when uh, there is science data transmitted back, uh, but we also have um, two, three, four, a few um, hard drives, um, SSDs in our science pod, uh, collecting the, the raw data, um, you know, ready to be post-processed um, or reviewed back on, on base, uh, any data that can't be fed back. Okay, we have a question from Margaret. How did you get the Mayflower back? Was it under its own power and its own decision to return? Yeah, so as I said, a few days uh, on its own traveling back. Um, do you know, I'm not sure about its own decision to return. Um, don't know about that one. <laughs> um, but yeah, so then a team from uh, Plymouth uh, had to go to recover the ship. Uh, they'd actually based in the Isles of Scilly for the sort of send off. Uh, and they had to, you know, go out for a couple of days to get the, the vessel. They had to wait for calm seas uh, and then they had to have a human um, attach a tow line. So that they, I think they had a very unpleasant 24 hours alongside the Mayflower, um, having kind of located it. And it, it did safely navigate to an area that, you know, it wasn't going to be at risk of any other ships. It, it kept low power so it could move if it needed to. And that was all autonomous. Um, but yeah, then they had to have somebody uh, lean over out at sea and hook a, mm, hook a tow <laughs> yeah, onto the top of the Mayflower uh, to then be towed back. Okay, Trevor has a question. Are part of this project open source that other projects, for example, a small boat working in a river delta could use? Um, parts of the projects. So currently, I don't think they are, but it is an ambition. Uh, that we have. Um, so that could be one to, to reach out to me on LinkedIn and we can maybe see if we can speed that process up or find out which parts will be useful and, and look, at, look to do that. Yes. <laughs> Dina, how heavy is it? Can you, because you said, you know, people had to come out, but can you just lift it, you know, with the plate? I, I presume it's usually heavy yeah i don't know the weight but no it's too too big yeah hard, yeah i i can never remember the measurements just to give you a kind of feel for the size but it's probably kind of this size of this room and maybe the width is sort of here to the these chairs so you know it's a good size ship um that would be too heavy so, so yeah you couldn't with two or three planes i mean military planes and you know. <laughs> probably with some military planes but <laughs> it's not being developed by elon musk it's a small company in plymouth uh, and a charity uh, and ibm with the technology but no one to pay those bills <laughs> is it, it i mean you know you never spoke that it could kind of i don't know what the term is but would it turn automatically like a kayak coming back to you know if it's because oh, are you with me? Did yeah. it automatically come back? No, this position? no, no, so no. no. Not a system that no, no. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yeah? yeah, yeah, it's at the mercy of the waves, which is why I didn't really talk about it, but the weather forecast is really important. And obviously, there is the IBM uh, weather company that is feeding in ultra high precision weather information and predictions so that it can, you know, feeding into the navigation system, you know, try and stay as safe as possible but that doesn't account for freak waves so yeah it's an a mission it's a um exploratory mission uh, with an unknown outcome <laughs> another question from Karen. hi just a quick question with your experience with the ai and the machine learning is there anything that that autonomous ship has done that has really sort of unexpectedly sort of tackled that Ooh, it wasn't sort of a good question to do. Yeah, I think that um, it, it hasn't really stretched its legs enough to answer that question. It is, in my opinion, really just at the start of its journey. Um, you know, it, it probably hasn't even spent that many hours at sea really collecting data. But that's one of the interesting things. It's going to be what is it going to see over um, you know the next few months in the sea trials that we're going to do the Atlantic crossing and then going forward. So hopefully, yeah, there will be some ex exciting and interesting gems in there. <laughs> Sorry, 
I have one bad of data, course, yeah. as you can see, our working data. Mm -hmm. um, what, following on from the lady at the front, what, um, if any, data have you obtained that has surprised you the most? Um, I mean, I, to be honest, personally, it was dolphins. Seeing video footage of dolphins, which you can see on mouse400.com, they've put a little snippet of the dolphin sighting, and I couldn't believe that. It was one of the marine biologists said that, yeah, there'll be dolphins. Dolphins always find the boats and they play. I thought, don't be silly, it's a massive ocean. They're not going to find our ship, particularly because we're looking for them. And, and they did. So we've got the video footage. We're now looking at the acoustics to see, you know, were we successful with class one. So yeah, that's been really exciting. Wow. Any more for any more? Okay, David, any more online? Okay, well, that is great. You <laughs> a great point in the evening. Rosie, that was a marathon. <laughs> really, uh, yeah, really oh, well. thank you. No, it was an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you so much all for taking the time to come and listen and uh, to be present and for your great questions as well. But yeah, I, I feel exhausted. I think I... <laughs> and you've still got a big journey ahead of you this evening. No, it's fine. Just a and quick, quick train home. Go to a school at least. <laughs> yes, no, I will, I will take my exit. But again, um, thank you all this evening. Thanks for everybody watching on Zoom mm. and uh, for being here. Please, you know, connect on LinkedIn. Uh, more than happy to continue the discussion uh, online or whatever. So um, I'll be out on maternity leave soon. But, you know, there's a team at IBM who are going to be continuing this work. Um, so, yeah, it's yeah, a lot more to come. <laughs> Wonderful. Brilliant. Best of luck with your upcoming <laughs> for my personal project. No. Sorry? When is baby? Uh, baby is due in quite soon, <laughs> a few weeks' time. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. No, really great to be thank here. You thank you. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Rosie. Super. We'll talk again later. Okay, no, we're not going to do that yet. No, no. Yeah, in a minute, David, could you please go to the slides? Because we need to pick up on the slides for Santana and for Margaret. Okay, well, little pause here. If you've got some wine, then please go and have it. <laughs> we'll wait here for a few minutes because we're going to go to the next thing. Yes, great, we, we can. I should let you know that we will now schedule to end at 8.15. So if you do need to have that wine, go and have it now. Meanwhile, we'll just make sure Rosie is on her way on the next stage of our exciting journey. The ocean floor is littered with our engineering failures and mistakes. You need to respect the power of what happens out there. There's still things to be discovered. If we have a zero risk philosophy, we are doomed. When we first conceived of this idea, I wasn't sure it was going to be possible. We were talking about an intelligent vehicle out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. We built a ship, put autonomy into it, and now we're learning what that means. You just maintain your course and speed. The pressure's certainly building as we're getting closer to the launch. There's a lot that we need to deliver. Right, front. Something going wrong. What keeps me up at night is we break down somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic, and it's something so trivial. Working on a boat like this, you kind of have to figure stuff out on your own. To get some drama. No, 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 we need to find out what happened, but it wasn't responding. So we'd lost comms. I just want to finish shaking her out and start across. The crossing, the crossing. The crossing. So when you say the crossing... Atlantic. That little bit. Yeah. Yeah, good luck. <laughs>
when it pulls out of Plymouth and I know it's not coming back for six months. When I see the rear end of it and the stern of her going around Ream Head, headed off west, that's going to be exciting. IBM really likes projects that are really pushing the envelope to do really exciting and novel things. What if we had hundreds of these vessels? This is going to transform ocean science. Trying and failing doesn't bother me. It's if we don't do everything we can do to ensure success. Well, thank you very much. David, please do go to Santana's slide, which is the one before that. So as we make sure that Rosie on, is on her way back to her home base of Winchester, now we'll go on to the next part of our evening, which is Santana and then more from Margaret. Well, let me pass you over to my colleague, Santana Lewis. Thank you very much, uh, Dalim, and thank you, Rosie, for an informative talk. Um, so good evening, everybody, and I'll aim in the next few minutes to give you a quick taste during the great green uh, week as to why we are minimizing e-waste. It, it should be a priority. priority. So examples of technology that are improving the sustainable development goals included what we just saw, AI technology, for example, blockchain, sensors, and biotechnology that Rosie just highlighted. And here are the six simple things to consider regarding minimizing e-waste. You may already be aware of them. So one, re-evaluate. Re do you really think that you need that extra gadget? Try finding one device with multiple functions. Two, extend the life of your electronics. Buy a case, keep your device clean, and avoid overcharging the battery. Buy environmentally friendly electronics. Look for products labeled Energy Star or certified by the Electronic Product Environmental Assessment Tool, EPIT. Four, donate used electronics to social programs and help victims of domestic violence, environmental causes, etc. Five, reuse large electronics. Six, recycle electronics and batteries in council recycling centers or deliver to charities. A useful website would be www.recycleourelectricals.org.uk, which is on the slide there. <clears throat> so let us all play our part as individuals for the sake of our future generations to come and our beautiful and precious planet Earth. So now we're just going to play a short video ab about our sustainability goal developments. Thank you. The great pandemic of 2020 changed our lives at a civilizational level. As lockdowns came into force, normal life came to a grinding halt. Yet many of us were able to adapt because of one fundamental reason. COVID-19 happened in the age of the internet. This graphic shows how quickly people replace public gatherings with virtual ones. As Wall Street, Main Street and schools went online, people began to notice a change in air quality. The silver lining appeared to be that nature was healing. But if we know one thing about the universe, it's that there's no free lunch. 
In order to work from home over Wi-Fi, we need a vast infrastructure of raw, hard material. This is a fiber optic underwater internet cable. Dozens of materials protect the internet from harsh currents, earthquakes, and the occasional shark bite. There are over 380 underwater cables in operation around the world, spanning more than 1.2 million kilometers. That's almost three times the distance from the Earth to the moon. Satellites carry a small but crucial share of communication and have their own material needs. The solar panels on these satellites require exotic metals like indium, cadmium and tellurium to keep them running. Back on Earth, there's a massive network of internet servers running behind the scenes storing and transmitting every video chat, social media post, and email. Every server requires an impressive list of raw materials. Some of them are extracted by hand, like tungsten from Uganda. Our investments in these raw materials have paid off well. Despite record unemployment, the internet made our economy more resilient than any other pandemic in history. However, access to the internet isn't evenly distributed. Consider the school districts that lack household internet in the US. The map is quite stark, particularly in rural and Native American districts. the developing world still has a massive digital divide. There are almost a billion people on the planet without access to electricity, let alone the internet. In order to survive the next pandemic, we'll need to expand the networks that helped us get through this one. This means mining, powering, and recycling more raw materials. The United Nations recognized this when it announced the Sustainable Development Goals for the planet in 2015. As we move to the post-pandemic world, let's not forget the infrastructure that made us resilient. Let's dig deep into the supply chains of these technologies and ensure they're responsibly sourced and evenly distributed. Thank you. So this brings more clarity to the six points that I hope <laughs> we're going to see again. No. That's it. Stop. That's it. To the six points that Santana mentioned. Things that we can do about sustainability, about eco, about green. And I'm sure you recognize lots of the themes there. Now, what I'd like to do is to introduce you or reintroduce you to Margaret Ross, who's waiting patiently at her home on the South Coast. Margaret, are you there? Would you like to give us your five minute presentation, please? Thank you. Um, hope you can uh, hear me. I'll actually put yes. my camera off just so that uh, to improve the, the quality of transporting. Could we move on to the sli next slide, please? Because one of the things that was uh, that Santana talked about was very much this e-waste, very, very important. Now, there's a problem with the e-waste. Uh, there's a lot of trouble to actually get the minerals and a lot of those minerals that are needed are in very short supply. So we have to be much more 
uh, careful about how we use them. Now, part of this comes back down to your manufacturers. Now, we need to possibly persuade them to redesign their mobile phones, their computers, so that they actually can be disassembled easily. So you can retrieve the gold, the other important minerals that exist within them. So this is good. This is good economics for the recycling side. And also, if we can recycle, then we can actually save those minerals because we are going to run out of those. Possibly not in my lifetime, but maybe children's or grandchildren's, yes, they are. Unless we've got a totally new way of actually having mobile phones and computers, not using the minerals that we currently use. Now, also, we can actually look at the idea of um, sharing. Now, a lot of discussion has gone on, particularly in the uh, EU in the last few weeks, about the problems about recharges. Now, it's possible that if you're using various laptops, etc., you might be carrying maybe three different sorts of rechargers in your, your uh, briefcase. Why? And in fact, if you've got three different chargers, they're probably using exactly the same minerals. So why three? Well, that comes back to certain companies not actually agreeing on a standard. Now, all the keyboards on, key on uh, computers are actually using the same QWERTY keyboard. Fine, that was agreed. But how about other things to agree? Like, shall we say, the rechargers. Now, we want to already cut down on this waste. We want to make mining of e-waste much easier, much more efficient, and actually bring you more money back as well. And so we've got to design also not only for disassembly, but also future upgrades. Now, a lot of work has gone on, and a lot of people look on the view that they should actually upgrade uh, their mobile phones every year. In fact, some people do, and they spend about a thousand pounds a year just purely getting the latest versions. Now, do you really need that? Maybe not. Now, instead of actually having a new machine, how about if you could actually take your machine back to the suppliers, they will open it up and make one or two minor adjustments rather than actually replace the whole mobile phone or whatever the piece of equipment is. Also, we've got another problem. When we look actually at the advertisements, now mobile phones, computers, they're becoming a fashion item. I mean, I was talking uh, to one of the suppliers and they said, well, oh yeah, sure, we, we produce them in four colors because people like to choose the colors. It's a fashion item. Mobile phones, computers shouldn't really be fashion items. They're actually very much using a lot of key, very limited um, minerals. So, you know, you might want to be a bit more careful about this one. So these are things maybe the manufacturers need to think about. Don't think about disassembly when you design them. Think about actually sharing between the different manufacturers. Think about actually being able to do the upgrades. You can still charge the same money, but you don't change so many of the components that don't need to be changed and certainly don't advertise it as a fashion item. And when you're purchasing, instead of actually saying, well, you know, um, what does it do? Is this the latest one? Uh, what colors are they in? Maybe we want to ask other questions about the birth and the end of life of the product. Thinking about actually what went into creating it and also more importantly, the end of life, the e-waste side of it. And also if we do this, it actually saves money. And to make you feel good as well, it will save the planet. Next slide, please. Now, to encourage this, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, the BCS has got involved with some competitions, and these are tied into COP26. Now, the closing date for these is actually the Tuesday 30th of November. There's two competitions, and these are very much to come up with the idea of a tweet or strap line with the idea of what sustainability means to me. Now, it's encouraging the youngsters to enter this from FE colleges, 
HE colleges, undergrad, postgraduate, full-time, part-time, and also open. So all the BCS members that are here, have a go at this. You've got 140 characters to play with. So how about it? You just send your entries in together with your um, BCS member. And if you're a student for the HE or FE, then it comes in from a point of contact from that particular education establishment. The other competition is for a PowerPoint. And this is from P to P, from primary to postgraduate. And again, here, the theme is very similar. What climate change means to us. Now, the entries are a single PowerPoint, maybe a picture, maybe with four or five or six bullet points explaining the message that you want to get across or the student wants to get across. Again, it comes in through a single point of contact at that education establishment, whether the students are in full time or part time. And it also applies to home educated students because they work together. Now, there's uh, we're just awaiting for this information, the full details to put online, and you'll find them on the Green IT Specialist Group Competition section. But as they're not quite there at the moment, if anybody would like the full information, you've got my email there, margaret.ross at bcs.org.uk. Send me an email, put in the subject line, please send details of latest BCS competitions, and I'll actually send you the two files with the full details of those. So at that stage, thank you very much. And thank you very much for listening. And please, please encourage people to take part. If you've got any links to schools, please tell them about this. If, and uh, some of the other BCS members that aren't here today, tell them about this, encourage them to enter. Because what we're going to do is at least some of the results that come through from this is actually going to be tied in with the BCS's um, participation for the COP26. Many excellent, things. excellent. Margaret, thank you very much and for clarifying that for us. Well, what I'd like to do to close off this session is to play you a final video. You see, I've got into this playing videos thing now because we have a final video which ties together the themes that we've explored in the last webinar and this one, which is about eco waste, sustainability, to do with the land and preserving the species, animals, plants, etc. And this time to do with the oceans and making sure that we still gather as much information and make the most of our beautiful planet. Now here's Coastal something resources. which ties those fish. together. Coastal resources such as fish, minerals and energy are critical to people and nature. They support the sustainable blue economy, which is a key part of the global economy. However, they are threatened by a wide range of activities on land. Scientists at the International Resource Panel identified the numerous pathways through which land-based activities affect coastal resources. They found that the most harmful land-based activities are agriculture, activities related to ports and harbours, and aquaculture. These activities are threatening coastal biodiversity and fisheries to an alarming degree. The overall deterioration of coastal resources puts the sustainability of the blue economy at risk. Fishing, aquaculture and tourism are particularly vulnerable. Some initiatives are trying to deal with the problem but mostly in individual sectors without enough coordinated action. The challenge is even bigger when the activities are miles away from the coast or even in another country where they can degrade coastal resources of a whole region. So how can we solve the problem? The IRP expert suggested five ways to strengthen existing land sea governance practices. First, use ecosystem-based management as a guiding principle. Second, enhance existing area-based management tools to better address land-sea governance. Third, improve coordinating mechanisms between different governance arrangements and sectors. Fourth, implement capacity building for land-sea governance practitioners. And fifth, fill in evidence gaps 
through scientific research. On top of these, we need new land-sea governance approaches, such as regional regulatory frameworks aiming to reduce the impact of land-based activities on coastal resources. Stakeholder communities representing land and sea-based activities. Monitoring and evaluation frameworks that reflect the connections between land and sea. And decision support tools that focus on impact pathways and not only the condition of coastal resources. In this way, we can reduce the impacts of land-based activities on coastal resources, realize the sustainable blue economy, and move closer to reaching the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 14, Life Below Water, and the other goals that it links to. Remember, tackling the impacts of land-based activities on coastal resources is a global priority to protect our oceans and our future, and the time to act is now. Learn more through the IRP report, Governing Coastal Resources, Implications for a Sustainable Blue Economy, available at www.resourcepanel.org slash reports. Thank you very much. Well, lots of food for thought. And of course, what we have for you is a lot of pointers how not only global things are happening on land and in the oceans, but some more homegrown things in terms of how you, we, can help. So I hope you've enjoyed that session and have taken note of some of the lessons there. We, of course, will continue to work on analyzing, researching, displaying, explaining, spreading the message. And I think you saw in that last video how IT people can help, not only to be a resource drain, as many others might see us, but how we can actually help with the environment, with the global goals and the aims of COP26 coming up in November in Glasgow in the UK. So please do continue to do your part. Let's all continue to do our part, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.